Today, the United States of America finds much of its strength in a well-rounded national economy in which agriculture, commerce, and manufacturing supplement each other. The man who helped set the pattern for our present economic system and who also contributed much toward national unity was Alexander Hamilton. He was born at Charlestown on the island of Nevis in the West Indies in 1757. With the early desertion of his father and death of his mother, Hamilton was virtually an orphan at the age of 11. A position was found for him as apprentice clerk in the trading house of Nicholas Kruger, one of the wealthiest merchants on the island of Santa Cruz. How long have you been with my trading house, Alec? Very nearly two years, Herr Kruger. You are not even 15. Yet I have made you a bookkeeper and put you in charge of the brand store at Friedrichstad. I trust I have given you no cause for worry as to my management. If you wish to inspect the store's accounts, I brought them for you. One item not entered. A case of special strong snuff for the burger. Already you see the close connection between business and politics, eh? <laughs> no, Alec, I, I have no complaint with your work. Tell me, my boy, what is it you, you really want? Success. I have often wished there were a war, so I might make the most of my ambition. Wars provide the background for quick advancement. It is odd that a youngster like you already distrusts utopian schemes. But then I appreciate your frankness. I shall be frank with you, Alec. I am seriously ill. I'm indeed greatly distressed to hear this. I need someone I can trust to take care of the business. You are only 14, Alec. And it will be a good joke on everybody. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> I have decided on you, Alec. I know you feel you've made a good choice. What? <laughs> Young Mr. Hamilton's statement proved to be quite modest. Kruger's affairs prospered under the boy's sound guidance. Oddly enough, however, it was a letter describing an island hurricane that brought Hamilton his next opportunity, and money was raised to send its talented author to the mainland for further education. At the age of 15, he was already embarking on a new phase of his career, an education at King's College. But there were the disturbing sounds that presaged the Revolutionary War. Never a spectator, Hamilton contributed his bit toward the growing dissension before he had reached his 17th birthday. Important persons began to notice Hamilton, and soon, in uniform, he stood before the most important of all, General George Washington. Now, see here, Hamilton. An offer of a position on the official staff is not to be taken lightly. Now, I would not have pressed this request originally, but uh, now that I know you for the pamphleteer who has supported our cause against the Tories with such a forceful and appealing pen, why, I must order you to wield that pen in my behalf. The general will understand that I am forced to obey his order, but I have no desire to be an ink-stained scrivener. Well, just what is it you're after, Captain? I offer you the position of a lieutenant colonel. The general does me great honor, but leaves me without the privilege of choosing battle duty and thereby achieving the prestige necessary to a man's future. Oh. It's glory, is it? <laughs> At ease, Captain. You're too practical not to grasp the opportunity I offer. No, I, I, I must rely on the, on the garb of the hero for early advancement. And advance yourself to an early grave. No, no. No, I prefer that you use your charm and mentality to further our cause and avoid such a glorious and final advancement. <laughs> <laughs> It was not long before Colonel Alexander Hamilton was known as General Washington's strong right arm. His advice came to be prized highly by the wealthiest men in the colonies, and his social graces soon made him one of society's most ill he met Elizabeth Schuyler. You've made me the happiest man in the world. I'm sure you're all that's good in it. Oh, the family has agreed to our marriage in December. Oh, Alec, I never dreamed that... Are you sure it's what you want? Is something the matter? It has nothing to do with you, Eliza. Shall I never learn to hide my feelings? It's the army and General Washington. You speak of him. And Washington is our only rallying point, but that doesn't make him right in everything, does it? When he chooses to make me remain as his personal scribbler, keeps me from promotion to position of... of, of Respect and authority. Oh, but I'm certain General Washington wishes you no ill. He needs you, Alec. Oh, Eliza, how I hate to be led. 
As long as I remain in Washington's shadow, I'm, I'm merely a follower, not a leader. I won't have you marry a mediocrity. Oh, never say that. You are so far above me, sometimes I think you must laugh at my ignorance. Sometimes I think that maybe it's a Schuyler name and wealth. Never be ashamed of wealth or position, Eliza. Only be worthy of them, as I must be. To this end, I must leave Washington and seek my future without him. I shall not be led. Alexander Hamilton returned to the army to command a unit at Yorktown in the final and winning engagement of the war. Then went home to study law. But he was constantly approached to venture into the field of politics. In 1787, representatives from the states gathered together in Philadelphia to write a new sovereign law for the nation. Although nine states ratified the Constitution, it was a hollow victory without New York and Virginia. In the New York Convention at Poughkeepsie, Hamilton fought for time for unqualified ratification. Alec, you know Melanchthon Smith. He would like to talk with you. Yes, I know Mr. Smith. His leadership of the opposition to the Constitution at the Convention has made him unforgettable to me. Thank you, Colonel. I am honored to debate with a man who penned the Federalist Papers. Sir, I may tell you I did not realize the wisdom of uniting the states until I read these papers. I've waited for you to say this to me, Smith. Colonel, do you really believe your Constitution will work? Don't call it my Constitution. For my part, it's as weak a document as was ever put together. But it's a beginning. It offers a slim chance for stronger unity of action. And I've learned to defend it. Perhaps to no avail. You're wrong, Alec. Tell him, Smith. Very well, General. Sir, I have changed my mind. I am with you, and will say so, and will vote for ratification. New York has waited too long. You'll never be sorry, Smith. There'll be a sound economy, a growing wealth because of this. And you and all of us will gain from it. Thus, using the tools he knew best, the pen and the political maneuver, Alexander Hamilton helped to make the Union an accomplished fact. And in 1789, George Washington selected Hamilton to be Secretary of the Treasury. But as Secretary of State, Washington chose the Virginian who'd been away in Paris as American ambassador, Thomas Jefferson. Oh, Mr. Madison, I'm sure young Hamilton is not such a villain. He's a fox, Tom. He'd have preferred to make Washington king instead of president. He wants the national government to assume the debts of all the states. But what's wrong with the Bill of Assumption? Unless our credit is backed by the government to the last dollar, we'll lose every bit of prestige we've gained in Europe. Don't you see, Tom? If those certificates are backed to the last dollar, Hamilton's supporters will be wealthier than ever, and the poor will be cheated. One day, he'll try to use the power of Congress to protect northern manufacturing to make us a nation enslaved by machinery. There, he'll find us Virginians greatly at odds with him. Is the president expecting me? He awaits, mid the pomp and protocol that Hamilton is assigned to the office. You'll feel as if you've never left Europe. <laughs> The president and I will have a good laugh together. Doesn't young Hamilton believe in democracy at all? I doubt it, Mr. Secretary. I doubt it. Hamilton soon pushed through the Bill of Assumption, which established the credit of the government. On its heels came legislation establishing a national bank under private control. Then came legislation for the minting of money for duties on imports and excise taxes on whiskey. But Jefferson decided to take a firm stand. And when Hamilton introduced a bill to aid the manufacturing interests with a high tariff barrier, the report was successfully pigeonholed. The lines were now clearly drawn. The moneyed interests believed Jefferson to favor mob rule. The common people believed Hamilton to favor their enslavement. No, Fano, there's no need for you to write that newspaper article. I think by this time I'm thoroughly capable of blasting the policies of Jefferson in my own hand. Though he prefers to draw on the talents of Philip Freneau to keep my name in public hate. You've been working too hard, Secretary Hamilton. Why waste the time on this matter? I can handle it for you just as well. Jefferson's talking of resigning now. Maybe I could give him the final push toward his decision. Now that he's stirred up the mob, 
started his great beast on the march, he may be a little afraid of taking responsibility for his actions. And yet, good time. <laughs> President Washington would like me to return to Philadelphia immediately. <sighs> I know what this means. Probably my resignation, because I, I can't take the insults and opposition of Colonel Hamilton any longer. You're not going to let him force you to resign, Secretary Jefferson. He's opposed all of my proposals on foreign affairs and is rapidly taking away my authority. Well, what about the people there behind you? You have their full support. If I was sure of that, I would remain. They need, all men need, leadership that will allow them to rule themselves. According to Hamilton, they need to be led by the well-born and able. There's no question but that he wants a dictatorship. I could only find some way to ruin him, I'd do it. He's been too clever for me. When I thought he was mismanaging government funds, he managed to clear himself. His kind of corruption is always out in the open, where it's least noticed, as evidenced by the way he guided the public debt into the hands of the wealthy speculators. Uh, he's a very dangerous man, Freno. He's very dangerous. It's no use, Mr. President. I will remain in the cabinet until you can replace me. But I must break ties with the Federalist Party once and for all, return to Virginia, and draw what is left of democracy and republicanism together. I'm afraid it's all my fault. Oh, you're wrong, my boy. He considers you a worthy adversary. I'm too much of a pessimist for him. He has faith in the people, real faith, but he doesn't understand that they can vote a demagogue, uh, an Aaron Burr, into power. What is this aversion you have to Senator Burr? I don't understand. He's likely to ruin me and the nation. Aaron Burr, he sits and he smiles and he creates nothing. And like a parasite, he feeds on my unpopularity. Oh, you've convinced yourself that he's a menace. But you've just given him a clear field, my boy, by chasing Jefferson off it. Senator Burr can now replace Jefferson in the people's affections. Thus comes the opportunist, the tyrant, clothed in the will of the people. Because you repose no faith in either one of them, between Burr and Jefferson, whom would you choose? I hope that such a choice need never be made. The Federalist Party will crumble. What will you do then? Then I might have to choose between Jefferson and Burr. But you know, sir, I've never heard Thomas Jefferson laugh at the people behind their backs. Orderly! Orderly! Hamilton's bout with yellow fever weakened him, and he soon followed Jefferson in resignation from public office. The death of Washington caused the disintegration of Federalist unity to become complete, and the split in the ranks of the aristocracy was bringing the election of the next administration into the hands of the people. Hamilton now had to make his choice. Good day, Mr. Hamilton. Your letter said you wished to see me. Yes, Mr. Bayard. As one of the leaders of the Federalist Party in Congress, perhaps you can tell me, who's it to be? Aaron Burr or Thomas Jefferson? The people will decide now. No, the Federalists in Congress will. The election will end in the usual hodgepodge of electoral votes and be thrown into the House. You can swing the choice to Jefferson there. I doubt if I can help you. Good heavens, man, you should consider... But why? Jefferson has virtually destroyed the Federalist Party. Would you rather support Burr? Perhaps. Jefferson thinks you will. Oh, he must despise me to think that I'd... I'd sell out to that adventurer. I do not care to listen to your attacks upon Mr. Burr. But since you mention it, sell what out, Mr. Hamilton? The nation. The people. Those words do not belong to me. But I shall do what I can for Jefferson, and so must the Federalists in Congress. Mr. Burr, your friend Hamilton appears in a great mood lately. Perhaps he is building up his courage. No, I'm afraid not, Harmon. He's been accused of many things, and in my opinion, is guilty of most. But I know that lack of courage isn't one of his failings. We were soldiers together. I meant the duel, Mr. Burr. It's on everyone's tongue, and certainly Mr. Hamilton must be thinking of it. When is the exact date? One week from today. Tell me, Harmon. Go. 
In my mind, I am justified. Even in politics, a man can take just so much. Sir, you should have challenged him long ago. Those names, those letters, especially when he permitted them to be published. As for public opinion, who knows? Yes, who knows? One week from today. Aaron Burr, past Vice President of the United States, achieved his revenge. President Madison, it does me great honor to be your guest here at the White House. I wish to heaven you had never allowed me to take the office, Tom. I envy you with your farm. A little peace and quiet after all these years. Well, I'm here with this bust of our old friend. It reminds me of the difficulties he began and that still persist. The constant pushing for high tariff, wealth, prosperity, success. The little lion, a brilliant man and a dangerous man. But he made the country's credit good. If you were in the White House today, you wouldn't find a bust of Thomas Jefferson occupying a place of honor, I'll wager. Perhaps, Mr. President. Hamilton and I disagreed completely, but that's what makes democracy. He shouted at me, harassed me, fought me, and made me consider well what I was about. And I did the same to him. Uh, he didn't quite believe in it, Jimmy, this democracy. Yet, one of his last acts was to defend freedom of the press in the Croswell libel case. And he had to decide once and for all. Alexander Hamilton was reasonable. Look at that face. Cold, aloof, austere. He feared the commonplace so very much. 